This video has been made possible by Haygears. Since finishing the prototype of the charging stand, I've been using it daily for a few weeks and I haven't picked up on anything that I feel needs changing from an ergonomic perspective. However, since publishing the video following the prototyping stage, I've had a lot of people ask when these are gonna be available. Although this was just a personal project, I thought it would be a good move before committing to making the forged carbon mold to think about this from a consumer perspective and redesign some of the components just in case that is a path that I take. With that in mind, I've redesigned and reprinted the front section and the charger holder. The threaded inserts are now set into the front piece so the charger holder can be attached from the front rather than from the back. This eliminates the need to take the entire assembly apart just to remove the charger. An idea from this was to create a non-charging version. I've created another holder that's interchangeable that's got an array of magnets in that match the MagSafe array that's built into the phone. The flexible pad that will eventually cover the charger will also be interchangeable between the two. Now I'm happy with how everything's assembled, I've designed one half of the mould for the forge carbon process. All of the angles are drafted, which is important for making sure the parts don't get trapped inside the mould, and it'll also help with separating the two halves. I'm printing this on the Hay Gears Ultracraft Reflex printer and I'm using their pulsing release module. This device attaches to the printer and reduces the peeling force when the build plate is lifted between layers. This means there's less chance of failure for a larger print like this and it can also shorten print speeds by 30-40% to 40 as well as reduce the amount of supports needed. It also has a dedicated pulse release tank that replaces the regular tank and works alongside the pulse release module, creating high frequency vibrations during printing. This print with the regular tank would have taken just under 17 hours to print at 0.5 mm layer height. This was brought down to just over 13 hours, which is a huge reduction in print time. Once the supports are removed, I can cure this off and start the prep work. There's minimal prep to do, just sand the areas where the supports have been and give the surface a once over with some 400 grit wet ready for primer. So I'm almost finished prepping the mold master. The only thing left to do on this is paint, just to give me a nice smooth surface finish. I've also printed a master of the front, which locates onto the mold master, and that basically makes up that first half of the mold. This front is slightly different to the printed front because I've added features into it which are going to help with the post-processing of the forged carbon part as well as features that will be transferred onto the other half of the mould. So I've blanked off these four holes just to simplify the mould a little bit but I've left these indentations of where I need to drill out just to make sure my alignment's correct. I'll also capture a negative of these four pins. These will act as pilot holes so I can drill from inside the mould cavity all the way to the outside. These are obviously where the threaded inserts go to hold the charger holder, but rather than having holes in the part like on the printed version where I can glue the insert in, I'm planning to put the insert inside the mould so it's embedded within the part. So those holes are drilled through the mould. I'm going to put an M3 bolt through it to expose a little bit of thread and then thread the insert on inside. And then once I compress everything together, the resin and fibre should go around the insert and directly embed that into the part. Making this mould is almost identical to making a box mould using silicon, just with different materials and mould releases. I'm temporarily securing the master to the mould master with double-sided tape. I've used 0.1mm tape to ensure it's as close of a fit as I can get, so there's a minimal gap between the two. You'll notice I've drilled a large hole in the mould master. This was a last minute thought and it'll allow me to push on the master from the back, keeping it in the mould when I remove the mould master. As the tapes create a small gap, I'm pushing filleting wax in to ensure the transition between the two is smooth because if there is a gap, the epoxy used to create the mould will lock the master inside. There are a few different options for mould release, each with their own considerations. I'm using number 8 finishing wax as it's not solvent based and has barely any build up. Now that's ready to use, I can create a barrier using polypropylene sheet that I've cut down to form the perimeter of the mould and to keep the epoxy contained. To form the mould, I'm using TC80 epoxy, which is an aluminium filled epoxy casting resin. 
This resin doesn't need degassing, but it is quite thick, so I would always recommend double potting to ensure the resin is thoroughly mixed. After mixing, I can carefully brush a small amount onto the surface to break the surface tension and pour the remaining material in and leave that to cure. Once it's cured, I can remove the barriers, flip it over and remove the printed mould half. This is where I'm glad I added the finger hole. Although the tape I used was low tack, it did a very good job of keeping the master stuck to the mould master. Without the hole there, I'm pretty sure the master would have come out of the mould at this point. I can now inspect the mould to ensure no nibs have been created between the master and the mould. I need to make sure all the filleting wax is removed as well and give it a good clean down. It's important that the holes that I drill in the mould later for the threaded inserts are perpendicular to the master's face. So for good measure, I'm loading it onto the CNC so I can face off the back of the mould. When I designed the mould master negative, I made sure that the base of it was also parallel to the master's face. So facing this off will allow me to drill them out on the pillar drill and be 100% sure they're at the correct angle. Once that's done, I can add some positive wedges from clay to create the openings where I can insert a wedge to separate the two halves. Then I can apply the mould release in several layers box the mould back up and pour the second side in the same way as before. Once that's cured, I can unassemble the barrier and face this side off as well. Then I can glue on some 12mm aluminium plates to either side. This is just to give the mould some additional strength and try and reduce any chance of it cracking when clamping the two halves together. Now all this is done, I can remove the clay, split the mould and clean it up ready for its first use. I can scrape off the remaining clay and remove all of the wax with a dedicated mould cleaner. The last step is to move it over to the pillar drill to drill out those holes that were created by the pins that are on the master. Now this is ready to use, I can apply the mould release. I'm going to use a solvent mould release at this stage so I don't get any build up on the mould surface. The epoxy won't be affected by the solvents in the mould release like the plastic would. So before I start using this, I need to add those threaded inserts in. And to do that, I've added mould release to the bolts. These hold the threaded insert on the inside of the mould. I've put mould release into the holes that these go through. But I'm also going to put some filleting wax on the threads and the threads on the insert just to try and make sure no resin can get onto the threads or through that hole. Because if any resin does get through there, there is a good chance that that part's going to get locked in if I can't take these out after. After threading these on, the excess filleting wax is pushed to the back of the insert. So as a final step, I'm making the wax flush, which will create the bottom of the hole. This process of compressing the chopped toe and resin was created by Matt and Paul from Easy Composites. Paul has a really good guide on this process, which is definitely worth checking out. The creation of the mold is something I'm very familiar with. As I mentioned, it's almost identical to silicon mold making, but this process is something I've never tried before. This is part of the reason I wanted to do this project in the first place, so I could try out new techniques and new processes. The ratio of resin to chopped toe I'm using is around 60% fibre to 40% resin. I'll apply some resin as the first base layer, then gradually build up the layers of fibre, wet those out, and then keep going until I've used all the fibre that I measured out to fill that cavity. Once it's fully loaded, I can compress the two halves together with G-clamps. I'll increase the clamping force gradually to allow the excess resin to flow out the mould. 
Now the resin's cured, I can split the mould. This is done by driving the wedges between the two halves, going around the perimeter gradually, ensuring the two mould halves stay as close to parallel as possible. Because of the mould release and the draft angles, the two halves have separated pretty easily. To release the part from the mould, I can back off those M3 bolts and use them as ejector pins. Once it's released, I can sand off all the flashing around the parting line and sand the flashing out from the opening where the cable goes. And finally, I can drill out those holes for the machine screws to go through. Because I've added those indents to the master, I can quickly and accurately drill those out. With this being the first one, I'm really pleased with how it's turned out and I'm starting to get an idea of what it's going to look like when it all comes together. There are a few tiny pinholes in the front of the part. To fix those, I've used Hagia's transparent resin. You could use any clear resin for this, but with it being UV cured, I can work as slow as I need to and cure it off in the curing oven quite quickly. With the part released, I can clean the mould up, reapply some mould release, ready to make some more. For the prep work, I can sand off the UV resin repairs and key the surface before clear coating. I've gone ahead and made a few more, but I'm only painting one at this point because I want to see the process through to make sure the prep work I've done is sufficient before committing to painting the rest. Now this is clear coated, it's completely changed the appearance and given the fibres a bit more depth. I've applied several layers of clear with a flow coat to finish, which has levelled out any of the minor imperfections. Now I've made a few of these, I've got a good foundation of a workflow down, which has given me usable parts. And the more I do this process, the more efficient it's going to get but there are some things I can change within the process that's really gonna speed things up because from a low volume manufacturing point of view, the recommended 24 hour cure cycle just isn't gonna be practical moving forward. Some things that have improved the workflow is to lay down a good coat of resin and let that sit for a minute. This decreased the amount of imperfections on the front face. Adding resin to the back side of the mold also helped in the same way. I decided to use the hydraulic press to compress the mold. I still use the G-clamps to guide the mould down as close to parallel as I could, but this definitely took less effort to push the resin out. I will say that the speed of compression isn't any faster. This has to be a slow closure to ensure the resin can find its own way out, which also contributes to the quality of the finish. As I found with a slower closure, the less imperfections I got as well. Keeping the pressure through the ram, I removed the G-clamps and used these smaller profile clamps so I could remove the mould from the press and put it in the curing oven to speed up the curing cycle. The working temperature is probably the most important variable, not only for resin flow, but to reduce any pinholes because if the resin is thicker, any air bubbles will have less chance of being able to self collapse. I tried preheating my resin and the mold to about 25 degrees, which did help, but obviously getting the room to a temperature would be the easiest option. Following the theme of workflows and efficiency, I'll be taking advantage of the pulse release module to batch print the other components. Using it on this batch will save around 37 minutes per batch, which over the course of multiple prints will compound into a lot of time saved and speed up the production workflow. I can make a start on putting together these batch files to quickly stock up on components. I had planned to print masters and mold some of the larger components, but with the reduced print times, it may well be more efficient just to directly 3D print those in batches as well. So I've printed and prepped the rest of the components so I can start assembling everything together. Because I haven't made the flexible pad yet, I'm gonna use the same test pad that I used on the original prototype, so I'll be able to mount the charger inside and see how it's all gonna look. So for those who haven't seen the prototype in stage, the charger goes into the holder from the front and then the pad goes over the top of that. On the test version, the charger goes into the back instead. So this is gonna function in exactly the same way because it's got the same dimensions as the charger holder and the pad when they're fully assembled. 
The assembly is somewhat similar to the original prototype, except for some of the fixings being swapped around. Because of that, I'm unable to screw in the mock-up pad, so I'm gonna double-sided tape it in place temporarily. It's nice seeing all this come together at this point from those initial sketches. Obviously, this is the first time I've made forged carbon parts, but it's also the first time I've ever actually seen it in person, and I'm really happy with how all of this has turned out. There's a lot of different ways I've seen to achieve the forged carbon look after researching, and although this method is probably the messiest, least forgiving, and most time consuming, there's no other way I've seen to achieve this look where you can see that the fibers have been compressed. This method will also achieve the strongest parts, which isn't an important factor in this case, but really what appealed to me was the appearance of those compressed fibers. I still haven't clear coated the other ones yet, but I did clear coat one of them in a matte finish just to see how that looks. I'm undecided of which of the two I prefer, not that I have to choose, I think both have turned out really well. The matte finish is a little more subtle as it appears flatter and blends in with the rest of the matte black parts, but with the gloss, it adds some dimension and definition to the fibers. So moving forward, I can shift my attention towards designing and making the molds for the flexible parts, as well as getting into a good workflow for everything else. There's been so much support for this project so far, which I am really grateful for. Like I said, this just started as a personal project for me, literally just so I can explore some new ideas and try some new techniques. But from the feedback and the requests I've got for these, this has now started to turn into something where I am at least looking to do a limited run. I don't know quantities or timeline or anything really at this point. All I know is from what people have said and for anyone who does want one, I would like to see just at least that limited run. So again, thanks for the support. I do appreciate it. And in the next video, we'll do those last final parts and get these complete.